AMD's Zen 3 processors are impressively fast, especially the giant 16-core 5950X. How did AMD squeeze out all of this extra performance, and do you even need all of this speed? Welcome to Upscaled, our explainer show where we break down the tech speeding up your video exports. Today we are talking about AMD's new processors. These are the Zen 3 or Ryzen 5000 series, and they are either the third or fourth iteration of AMD's modern processors, depending on how you count it, and they are the culmination of an underdog story that currently has AMD closing in on a 25% share of the desktop and laptop market, which is not bad for a company that nearly went bankrupt a decade ago. We got our hands on the 5950X, AMD's new 16-core flagship, and ran it through a bunch of tests and compared it to the best Intel chip we've got on hand. Spoiler alert, it is super fast, though I'm not sure how much that actually matters. First up, how did AMD manage to improve speeds? Remember in processors, there are pretty much three ways to speed up a chip. Now, in reality, any of these are a crazy challenge on their own, but to simplify, first you can either improve the manufacturing process, making smaller transistors and letting you pack more logic onto each chip. You can increase the power used to boost speed so the chip does more work per second, those all important gigahertz, or you can improve the chip's architecture and design, the way it actually processes data. Any one of these is typically good for about a five to 10% improvement in overall performance generation to generation. But the remarkable thing is that AMD is claiming a 19% improvement in instructions per clock without changing the manufacturing process or the chip's power draw. All of these improvements are coming from changes to the architecture and design. To lay out our terms here, clock speed is the number of operations a chip can do per second, usually measured in gigahertz or billions of operations per second, and instructions per clock, or IPC, is the number of basic operations like mathematics or copying data that the chip can perform every clock cycle. For more information on all of this stuff, check out our RISC or ARM videos. The biggest change to Zen 3 comes from how AMD has changed its chiplet design. Now, this was actually the topic of one of our very first upscales, but here's the idea. Most chips have traditionally been monolithic. They've been made out of a single piece of silicon. Monolithic, literally one stone. AMD's Zen 2 chips kind of upended this whole idea. They were built out of small individual chiplets that were all linked together to form the final processor. The main reason for this is that AMD was trying to move to a new improved manufacturing process, the so-called seven nanometer node, at a time when it was still brand new. Chips made on this process were faster and used less power, but it was also new enough a lot of chips had defects, and it was expensive. By splitting its CPUs into chiplets, AMD got two main advantages. First off, smaller chips are less likely to be defective, and AMD could still make the parts of the chip that don't benefit from a new manufacturing process on older, more reliable technology. This part was the I.O. die, which handles communication between the processor and the rest of the computer. This was successful, but it's definitely not ideal. In a Zen 2 chiplet, called a CCD, cores are arranged in groups of four, called a CCX. These are plenty fast, but whenever a Zen CPU has to move data between the CCXs or between chiplets, it slows things down. So here comes Zen 3. The seven nanometer manufacturing node is now way more reliable and robust. And so what does AMD do? They inch back towards monolithic chips. Zen 3 still has a separate I.O. die, but each CCX is now the full eight cores. This simplified design has some big improvements. The most important is that each core now has full access to the CPU's massive 32 megabyte L3 cache. We may need to do a video entirely on CPU caches someday, but the main idea is that your computer actually has a bunch of different tiers of memory. To access information, first data is loaded from your storage disk, your hard drive or SSD, into the main memory, the RAM, which is an order of magnitude faster, but most folks have much less of it, only say eight to 32 gigabytes or so. Side note, I just bought 128 gigabytes because I use Adobe products. And it's also, it's just so shiny. As the CPU processes data, it loads information from the RAM into a series of caches called the L3, the L2, and the L1. Data moves from three to two to one into the actual registers in the CPU where it's processed. Each cache is smaller than the previous one, but again, much faster. Now, ideally the CPU can load everything it needs directly from the L1. Whenever it has to go to a higher level cache to find data, that takes longer. 
Now, things really slow down when the information the CPU needs isn't even in the cache and it has to go find it in the RAM. Making sure needed data is ready to go in the cache is actually one of the ways that modern processors run so fast. The previous Zen chips had 16 megabytes of L3 cache per chiplet. Now, this added up to either 32 megabytes or 64 megabytes per processor, which is quite a lot, actually. But each core could only directly access the 16 megabytes on its CCX. If a core needed to access data that was stored on the L3 of another CCX, it would slow things down as bits had to be shuffled around. In Zen 3, by combining the chiplets into an eight core CCX, each core can access the full 32 megabytes of cache. There are a bunch of other improvements here, including changes to branch prediction, which is the way the chip tries to guess what instructions it will need next, and ways those instructions are decoded or stored. But they're all based around trying to keep a constant stream of data flowing through the processor without any stalls or hiccups. One interesting thing, I spoke with Mike Clark, one of AMD's design engineers, and he said even though the entire Zen 3 redesign is based around trying to keep information flowing through that chip, the I.O. die that handles data transfer out of the chip is pretty much unchanged from previous generations. It's still built on the same old 14 nanometer process, too. There's just not a lot of benefit to be gained from rebuilding that part with new smaller transistors. So how fast are these chips? We got sent to the 16 core flagship 5950X, which runs at 3.4 gigahertz base speed with a 4.9 gigahertz boost and is currently retailing for $799. Now, for most folks, this is a totally unnecessary processor. But for my work, which is primarily as a video editor, it's actually got the potential to speed up what I do. So that's how I approached our testing. The biggest problem we had was finding a good chip to test this against. The next fastest processor we had on hand is Intel's i9-10900K, which is still a very fast chip, but at 10 cores and a much cheaper $539, it's not exactly a fair fight. Still, it's a useful basis for comparison. We paired both chips with 16 gigabytes of RAM and an NVIDIA 2070 Super GPU. In synthetic benchmarks like 3 Mark and PC Mark, we actually didn't see that much of a difference. The productivity-focused PC Mark doesn't always scale great with high core counts, and the 5950 scored 8008 versus the 10900K's 7215. In 3D Mark Time Spy, the 10900K scored 10,193, and the 5950 squeaked ahead at 10,294. We did a video a few months ago about how pretty much any modern processor is actually fast enough for gaming, and it's your GPU that really matters, and these results kind of bore that out. Running at 1920 by 1080, we saw almost identical scores in Rise of the Tomb Raider at 74 and 75 frames per second, though Wolfenstein Youngblood showed a more pronounced difference, with 270 frames per second on the 59 50 and 128 frames per second on the 10900K. That's a huge gap, but I have to imagine over 120 frames per second is still probably enough for most folks most of the time. If gaming is your focus, maybe stick with a 6 or 8 core chip and spend the extra money on a good GPU. Especially if you are looking at either 4K gaming or using ultra high settings, pretty much any modern processor will do fine when paired with a solid GPU. Moving on to content creation, we do see some bigger differences. In Handbrake, transcoding a 4K clip from a C300 to H265, the 10900K took 8 minutes and 39 seconds, while the 5950X finished in a mere 5 minutes and 25 seconds. Similarly, in Adobe's media encoder, the 5950X beat the 10900K 2 minutes and 21 seconds to 3 minutes and 24 seconds when encoding a 4K MP4, about a third faster. In 3D software Blender's benchmarking tool, which I wish they had named Blenchmark, the 10900K completed the renders in 35 minutes and 37 seconds, again about a third slower than the 5950X at 21 minutes and 20 seconds. These are big improvements, but they scale pretty closely with core count. After all, the 5950X has about a third more cores than the 10900K. We do see a bigger difference in Cinebench, the test based on Maxon's Cinema 4D. Here, testing just one CPU core, the 10900K scored 538, while the 5950X blew past it at 644. AMD has traditionally lagged behind Intel in the per-core speeds, so this is pretty impressive. 
testing all cores, the 5950X won with a massive 10,486 versus 6,262. This is a serious boost in speed. Even a one-third improvement in export times could save me hours off of a big project, especially when you consider how often I misspell things and have to redo them. I decided to run one last media test. We've been shooting more and more with Blackmagic's 4K pocket cameras, and I've been doing more editing and finishing work in Resolve as a result. Now, Resolve is famously GPU dependent, but it can also take advantage of serious CPU horsepower. So I set up an effects heavy export to really put these chips through the ringer. Now, the 10900K finished its export in 15 minutes and 7 seconds, while the 5950X came in underneath at 15 minutes and 1 second. Huh? So this is kind of the problem. In really processor-focused programs like Handbrake, the advantages of the 5950X are apparent. But in more and more media applications these days, the GPU, the graphics card, is becoming as important as the processor. On our Adobe test, for example, I had to manually set the rendering engine to only run on the CPU. Heck, on my work computer, which has an 8-core 9900K processor, half the cores of the 5950X, instead of running it solely through the CPU, I also enabled my Radeon 7 graphics card, and it finished in 52 seconds, more than twice as fast as the 5950X by itself. Hardware rendering on Adobe used to be pretty lousy, but these days you'd have to really zoom in to spot the differences. Same with Blender, since version 2.8. CPU rendering is still a bit more accurate for a lot of applications, but GPU processing has come a long way. With that in mind, the Blenchmark, run through our test computer's 2070 Super Graphics card, completed in 19 minutes and 19 seconds, about 2 minutes faster than the 5950X. And switching over to NVIDIA's proprietary optics rendering mode, it only took about 8 minutes. The 2070 Super is not a budget card, it launched about a year ago for $499, but today that'd get you the much faster RTX 3070. You could add in the 6-core 5600X for the same total price as the 5950X, and you'd outpace it in a lot of applications that support GPU acceleration. Now, if you've got all the money in the world, get both. But my point is, in a lot of situations, the 5950X might not make as much of a difference as upgrading to a better GPU. I'm not saying the 5950X isn't fast. It really sincerely seems to be the fastest consumer processor available today. But unless you need to squeeze every last drop of CPU performance from your computer, you can probably get away with an 8-core chip, even for media work. Other reviewers have found the 8-core 5800X is only a bit slower than the 10900K in most applications, and it's much cheaper at $449. And if you really do need as much CPU power as possible, the 12-core 5900X thrashes pretty much everything except the 5950, and it's $250 less at $549. Look, there are some applications that really do benefit from more CPU power, things like file compression and compiling code. And even though they don't scale perfectly, even applications like Photoshop and Illustrator lean pretty hard on the CPU. And if you're someone who constantly leaves 500 Chrome tabs open while streaming music and watching Twitch, then yeah, sure, more cores doesn't hurt. If you're in a professional setting, you probably already know that even just a few percent increase in speed up may be worth the extra cash. But my point here is for the average user, a decent processor and a GPU upgrade may take you farther than an $800 chip. Now that said, this 5950X is probably going in my editing machine, because holy cow, it really is fast. And even a few minutes saved here and there will add up for me. But if I was building a whole new machine from scratch, I'd probably save my money and go for a better GPU upgrade, because my Radeon 7 is getting a little old. Let us know what you think. Are you planning to upgrade to Zen 3? And do you have any applications that can actually benefit from 16 cores? Or maybe you're saving your money for one of those new Radeon GPUs or NVIDIA's rumored 3080 Ti. Let us know in the comments. Now that we've done this CPU test, we may try to get our hands on one of these new GPUs and see how much they speed up the same tests. As always, stay tuned to Engadget and be sure to like and subscribe. We'll catch you next time.